Hello, my name is Emily Moyer. I'm a co-host and producer of Off Planet Radio. And it has been the great honor of mine for the last three years to get to meet and talk to all sorts of interesting people. And um, we have a video coming with Elisa E, who is a many time guest on our show. And she always delivers interesting information and this time is no exception. Um, but I also wanted to tell you guys a little bit about my friend Elisa. Um, she is a survivor of MKUltra mind control programming and ritual sexual abuse. And for the last 10 years, she has been sharing in a raw and emotional fashion the things that she experienced and the things that she has shared has helped other people to be able to come to terms with, recognize, and move past the things that have happened to them and there is a cost for having revealed some of the information that she reveals and some of that cost has come to her health her personal well-being and her ability to earn and sustain a living and today she is asking for help and it is my honor to be able to try and offer some of that help um, she is in need of a medical device and procedure to help her to sleep and to breathe both are things that are necessary for any quality of life and so we're asking for anybody who has found her information interesting, touching, helpful, anything to donate a small amount or to um, purchase one of her books in order to assist her in achieving her goal of raising the funds to be able to have this procedure. Um, Elisa has spent countless hours helping myself and many other people who are in the process of deprogramming, awakening, recovery, or just trying to find out what is true in this world. And I, she never asks for help. so. Today she is, and I honor her for her bravery and asking, asking for help, and I hope we can all pitch in a little bit and help her to, help her to receive what she needs to uh, be able to move on and enjoy her life. So her GoFundMe account will be linked below, um, both in the short video here and in the video, the episode to come. And I ask that you guys please go there and check it out, and if you find it in your heart to donate, please do so. Thank you very much. You guys have a nice day. All right. This is Off Planet Radio. Hey everybody, welcome back to Off Planet Radio, Off Planet TV. I am Emily Moyer and we have one of our favorite returning guests today. About three years ago, she was a guest on the show for a first time and we recorded a show that you guys should all go listen to called Deep Ultra, where we dove into some of the less talked about aspects of mind control programs, some of the less glossy, less super soldiery, uh, you know, glamorous <laughs> style, you know, discussion of, of MKUltra into some of the nitty gritty Ick, I don't even want to think about it kind of stuff. Um, but uh, today we're going to do an update on some of that. And actually, it's funny, before the guest told me that was what she wanted to do, I just was thinking, we're going to make this Deep Ultra part two. I don't know why, just kind of intuitively, I knew we were kind of going there. So uh, we're going to dig into and update some of the topics that were first discussed three years ago on the Deep Ultra show. And then uh, in the patrons hour, we're going to talk about some more personal programs and uh, just some of the latest cutting edge thoughts that we are having about some of this kind of stuff, some things that maybe we, you know, aren't quite ready to prove yet, but some open discussion about that. So please join us in the patrons hour for that as well. So welcome back to Off Planet Radio, Lisa E. Thank you for joining me again. Hey, Emily. Good to be back. Yeah. Yeah. And you and I keep in touch and keep each other updated through outside of the shows. So this ought yeah. to be pretty interesting to two yeah. of us. Yeah, we have probably some of the strangest conversations <laughs> anybody would ever imagine. I but, know, I know. So, uh, pro probably, probably give them some ideas because they listen to yeah. the conversation. <laughs> and I say this to when I talk to Sophia too. I'm like, you better be careful. You're giving them ideas, <laughs> right? Yep, yep. They haven't thought of that one yet. They'll definitely use it now. But anyway, so yeah, I, it's hard to believe that that was about three years ago we had wow. on the show the first time. Wow, that is, yeah. yeah, that's wild. Yeah, time just goes and goes and goes. So, well, you know, and, and it's been quite an interesting journey because there's the personal deprogramming aspect, which is, you know, can be very, uh, uh, what would I say, can be very sequential, you mm -hmm. know, which I discovered. Uh, I think I shared that with you. You know, there's the aspect of 
um, after doing it for like a whole, the first summer, I realized there was a pattern that, for example, that they even plan your deprogramming process, mm-hmm. <laughs> meaning uh, things show up in a certain order mm-hmm. because there's the really protected material that can't show up in the, in the beginning, but like the child alters show up early and because they're very emotional and sound crazy and there a lot of them were for me were fragments and and it just it sounded so if you didn't understand mind control and mind control programming at all you just really almost discredit yourself so it's been a really interesting journey there's that aspect of going through um and discovering that there's you know you're not supposed to survive long enough to get to the really deep stuff they don't want you to know Mm-hmm. And a lot of that stuff has surfaced for me now. And there's still, you know, it's been 11 years of what I call deep deprogramming. I was waking up before then, um, but just didn't know where to go. And it wasn't until, as I shared before, you know, meeting the two guys in Salt Lake City who knew about this, that was when the dam broke. It was like having someone say, not only do we know about this, we work with people like you. And it was like literally 24-7 alters, memories, everything just started flooding forward. So there's been a lot happening in 11 years. I've, I've developed a much more um, um, strong, centered part of myself. I'm able to not get into fear or emotion, you know, over a lot of things. I'll see something trigger me. And it's like a, there's this really strong self that just can say, well, that's okay. You know, that's okay. No worries. Let's take a look at this. You know, just a very, um, very different process now. Really different process now. Um, not that nothing ever hits me, but when it hits me, I can recover like that. You know, I can, I can take charge and um, I call that my, my true high self. The part of me that's really spiritually connected in now. So so yeah, it's um, 11 years in, it's really, really fascinating to see what uh, still holds very true. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's still absolutes for me. And then other things that have become questionable as to what their source was, why, why I believe that, say, 10 years ago. And now it's not that I don't think it pertains, it's that I think I now see possibly another, another reason why that was there and why I held that so deeply. So yeah, yeah, lots is lots is going on. It is really it is so interesting like the phases you go through of being really very sure about something, you know, and then later maybe not so sure when you you know and then later sure again and then you think yes. you know why and, and it's completely not at all that reason why. There's a different reason why. That seems like, you know, like in in fact like I think sometimes we make we like especially like not maybe in the very beginning, but like a couple of years in, two two to four years in, we really complexify it. We come up with all these really interesting, like very very detailed stories as to why, and it's just like on mm-hmm, that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was really much more simple and plain and and whatever. And and I think that like uh, one of the things I'm really coming to recognize is that like there's all like I mean, i've always known this but it's becoming clear the personal parts of the programming like the parts that are really specific to you those are all technologically run right there's not enough people in the world to keep track of all the super personal stuff even if you have a handler like you know what i mean there is it you know or several handlers right the amount of information that we consume technologically now no single handler could keep track right, of that, right? right. So it's kind of the technology that really spits the personal programs at you and the uh, quote unquote real people like they, you know, they're running the general old school part of the program. on you. Would you agree with that? Um, yeah, I think, I think I understand what you're saying. And I would say, I think there's been a dramatic shift in what MK Ultra is and yes. how it's done. Yeah. You know, a lot of people don't realize, and this sounds sci-fi now. I think of all the things that used to sound sci-fi and now what sounds sci-fi. And what is an absolute fact is they can, from beginning to end, from beginning to end, completely program someone remotely. Yes. There is not a need to take you to, a, a, like in my case, an Air Force base or, you know, an underground facility or any of that. I'm not saying they don't do that anymore. I believe that there's always going to be some of that going on. But it is 
uh, I'll, I'll steal the phrase from Ilana Freeland's book, EMK Ultra, electromagnetic yeah. Ultra, or electronic, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you're right in yeah. that I think the younger generations are now, there can, don't get me wrong, there's still somebody in many cases, I know this from, from TIs, um, and getting it secondhand from people who have worked with TIs, that there are in cases very, uh, very much of a, a person yeah. that is in charge of all of it. I mean, they're talking, you know, V2King, I'm in the head, and they're, they're testing things. And so there are still people involved, but it is, it's a whole different ball of wax. I mean, when I came up, I crossed over um, partway through my use years, I think, I think it was probably in the 80s. Um, it may have even started in the 70s. Uh, it did start in the 70s, sorry, because I, I'm sure now that it started in my teens. I used, excuse me, I used to think that it was strictly an entity that was with me. Mm -hmm. And that there wasn't, because I had these memories come up that there's no handler here and I'm switching alters and I'm going into my next task. And I would always have this sense of a presence. And I do believe there are entities involved, even with the tech, by the way, they do ride the technology. But what I'm realizing in the years of deprogramming and learning what the technology is about today for MKUltra, I was crossing over into um, having hands-on handlers present mm -hmm. into remotely being triggered into mm -hmm. another altar and sent on task so that, and think about the benefit of that for them. I mean, they don't need anybody there. They can just bam you from, from a distance and send you off to do whatever you need to do and pull up whatever state of mind or alter personality, in my case, alter personality. And I mean, I remember, Emily, I, I wrote these things down and I didn't even understand really what was happening. How is it I'm switching right now? Um, I mean, there would be a behavior also involved in some of these, which I won't go into right now, but I would do something and then I'd switch into another altar. And I was sitting in front of a place that I was supposed to go in and do whatever I was supposed to do. So I think you're right, but the hands-on is still, is still there. It will always be, yeah. Yes. And partly because I think they just, a lot of sadistic, they get off on it. Um, you know, there's nothing like having complete and utter control over another human being for, for psychopaths. So there's that. Plus, I think they're really into the um, esoteric ritual side of it, you mm -hmm. know, performing rituals with MKUltra victims. And I think there's a real, uh, a real charge for them. Mm -hmm. and I mean that on an esoteric level, I believe that absolutely they believe and probably know that by doing those things, they're uh, energetically gaining power from these mm -hmm. dark forces. So, so you're absolutely right. It is a, it is a whole new ball game now. And well, I, I crossed over in the seventies. I believe they started implementing remote with me. Um, and there were still hands on throughout the years, throughout the decades. But I believe I was one of those people that crossed. So there's that. two things there that I want to pull at. So one is that mm, the remote thing. So let's shelf that for a second and how, it, how I, and the crossing over. But I think the reason why they'll always be hands-on is a, like there's a certain kind of fear that it's a different kind of fear that's induced in person than some, like the, 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 te yeah. the technology fear is more paranoia. The in-person fear is more primal. It's right. like different ca causes. Know, a different it's right there in the room yeah. with you. Yeah. But also, as we move into a, you know, obviously, whether, whether you believe we completely live in the simulation or there's just a simulation overlay, we're living in that right now where there's this thing that's obviously here all the time that's technological, and then it, we at least have memory of something more organic, and then it's really confusing where the two are sort of interplaying, right? And so having a person whose mind you're trying to scramble, confuse, or control, never be sure which stuff was actually quote unquote real and which stuff was part of the simulation or the technology or whatever is a really good way to keep them confused yeah. and to not know what to trust. Right. Yeah, I, mean, I, can, I can vouch for that because as I said, as we talked about briefly before we started recording and, and some of the stuff we're going to talk about, I'm 11 years in and I think people think you just, okay, you recover a memory and that's, there it is. And it doesn't work that way. It's like there are things I've, I'm 57 and I've struggled with this 
and still struggle with certain things. I still don't know if it's real in the sense of, was it a physical experience or was it an astral? And I've discovered that several of my physical experiences, there were a whole shitload of them. So I'm not denying that, but several of the ones that I thought were physical. Now I understand I was in my astral body Mm -hmm. and I was having a full on, you know, uh, running well i'm back in new mexico by the way and this was oh my god this area was huge for me during that time and this is when i was really waking up and this is where i had the episode of where i escaped i escaped from a facility and i i could show you the i've driven it a hundred times since i've been back uh you know the road i was running down naked in the middle of the night and i see the helicopter coming out of Towski valley with the retrieval team in it And I know it's 18 miles as the crow flies to that location. And I'm running full out. I mean, you know, as fast as I can. Well, I've now begun to think, I can't claim either, but I was devout that it was physical. Now I'm starting to think because I was was caretaking. Or a, a friend of mine who was a caretaker, she wanted to go away for a few days and I stayed at the property. And I know I had an experience that night and I'm starting to think that it It was an astral experience, partly because an alien, little gray, showed up and rolled me off the bed, but I went up. I didn't go down. (laughs) And I could never figure out, it's like, was he, you know, floating me, levitating me? And well, that was my astral body. He was knocking my astral body, pulling my astral body out and probably sending me on this this experience that was, and it, it felt full on physical. But when I really think about certain aspects of it, it very well could have been a full-on astral programming experience. Mm -hmm. Absolutely full-on. And there probably was this whole team and all these people involved, but I was in my astral body and I was trying to escape them in my astral body. So, so yeah, I I totally uh, agree that there's the physical aspect, but I'm, I'm also starting to think based on other people's research and other people's experiences. And then some of mine with in the last handful of years, as you know, there's been some things that have happened. um, um, Yeah. In the last few years. And some of those are definitely, a lot of them are definitely remote, uh, remote uh, instigated. I'm starting to think that, okay, this will, this will get into some, this will get into some very esoteric side, but I'm starting to think, you know, you talk about this simulation. Uh, for me, what I see it as is something called the eighth sphere. Mm-hmm. And this is Rudolf Steiner material. Um, I don't know that he came up with the eighth sphere, but he really truly elaborates on it. This is a, we're in a certain age, a certain epic that we're in, era. And the Arimonic age, which is why all this technology has come forward and is being used in the capacity that's being used is this Arimonic age. But anyway, part of the role of that Arimonic energy is to bring the what's called the eighth sphere into uh, into manifestation. And it's it's like it's it's there. Uh, kind of like we all have a double, we're born with a double. Well, it's there, but it's being uh, brought into manifestation in a in a much more <laughs> frightening way um, through the technology. Um, and, uh, you know, when you throw in um, all the technology that we're addicted to, that we carry around day in, day out, all the towers, all the next rads, all the, the CERN, the D-Wave computers, big, big, big part of this, D-Wave computers, um, what's happening, we're moving into, through, through some TIs. Um, I'm getting this secondhand through someone um, who is working directly uh, weekly, it meets once a week with this TI. What's happening is the eighth sphere is, on, a, on an esoteric spiritual level, what the eighth sphere is, is a false version of our reality. Yes. Um, it, there's a false earth. There's a false every person. There's a false everything over there. And this is being brought into uh, a stronger and stronger manifestation because we have been brought to this state of no critical thinking. Uh, don't question anything. 
everything has to be politically correct. God forbid you hurt someone's feelings. Or So what's happening is we're being so dumbed down that we're willingly giving over to this, this energy of technology, which is creating more and more as to each day passes this strength in this eighth sphere. And the concept with this Arimonic energy is to bring people literally consciously their consciousness into the eighth sphere which if if i were to try to compare it to something in this so-called physical reality it would be virtual reality so i think the thing that was that so whenever they're trying to introduce something like this there has to be either a ritual performed to sort of introduce it or something inserted. And I think the thing that really brought this online massively was Pokemon Go. If you go back and listen to uh, both Sophia and Randy wrote articles and did shows where they talked about getting people to interact with this other reality, like, because it was there before, right? Yeah. And we're here. And in order to really bring it in, you have to get a certain mass of the people to interact and engage it. And yeah. It's just like anything else. Entities, energies, all these things can exist out there, but they don't actually have any power until people start to engage them. And this Pokemon Go became a ritual and engagement between this, you know, uh, sort of mesh alternate reality and this here that's a little bit more defined right yes and the you know and, and what i noticed is that you know people all the people that were into playing pokemon go they're totally gone yeah. and, and the people that never even looked into playing it they're still pretty much with us and then well, there's this is apparently in the ti realm um this person is now experiencing things in his room in his space because mm -hmm. um, I think back of some of the some of the entities and things but what he's experiencing is clearly a full-on um, virtual reality being brought into his space into his room beings that he's not not uh, they're not trying to create the entity so much as think of like uh, cartoon characters. That's what. Do you know what Pokemon that, Go is? Uh, yeah, that come fully to life, and yeah. he's he is aware of mind control. He is aware of these things being done to him. He's being told a lot. To be honest with you, he's being told. But in other words, when I understand about the eighth sphere, what I see happening through this arimonic energy that is, forgive me, but you know. It's not that technology in and of itself is bad, but in this age that we're in, what has happened to humanity is the technology is creating this, mm -hmm. okay? This is an arimonic energy, and what they're going to do and have started doing, because I'm thinking back to a woman who she went after, a really brilliant woman, went after somebody, um, a high, I won't name them, two high profile, one's Hollywood and the other is Aquino. I'll go ahead and say that. She went after them in the 90s and they went full on on her and literally sent her via her mind into hell. Okay, I saw her writings online. Uh, someone sent them to me and said, you know, here's what happened to her. This brilliant woman is now, I mean, she went to court and everything and then this all happened. and. She is submerged, literally submerged in hell. Her mind is gone. Yeah. And this is what I see. It doesn't have to be that hell, hell on earth, but in other words, here's a physical person who's alive in a physical reality, and she's completely gone into another world that they created. They programmed this world and sent her to it. And what I'm saying is this eight sphere, which has been around forever, um, this is not new. This, this, what I'm seeing in the current age is the manifestation, the avenue that is now going to bring those who have no sen genuine sense of their own consciousness. Um, they can't think and question. They're not willing to look at anything of this stuff that we're talking about. They just want to go have a good time, blah, blah, blah. You know, this sense of, um, I'm just here to have fun and, 
and have a great life and I have money or whatever, you know, and I can go do whatever I want. Well, that's not what we're here to do, you know, and this, this whole eight sphere, that's what this Arimonic slash Luciferic energy, it's mainly Arimonic. Um, this Lucifer had its time and now it's the Ariman's time. And that's what this, uh, why Gordy Rose says, you know, it's like, being next to the D-Wave computer is like uh, standing next to an altar to an alien god. Oh god yeah. And he's not joking, okay? Th there was no joking about it. This guy was completely sincere. Um, and he's had other talks where he's, and I think Elon Musk... Did you ever, did you ever hear him on... Uh, he was on with Kev Baker. I never got to hear that. I, somebody sent it to me and I just never... I didn't. I didn't. But I Kev Baker interviewed him. And I know Kev Baker was one of the first people to really report extensively on the D-Wave and... Yes. And, in the alternative with, with, and, with Anthony Patch and yeah yeah um so I I've never gotten to listen to that but I probably should go back when uh, in, so, the, so in the pocket you, universe I'll create one day to go listen to all the media I don't have time to listen to right. I will go listen <laughs> and you know I mean you can't here's the thing you know I've I've talked quite a bit about my appreciation for someone like Alana Freeland and the reason I keep trying to push her books isn't because I know her. It doesn't have anything to do with that. What it has to do with is she's showing people in a series. She's got two out. She's writing the third. She's showing people the link between all this stuff. What I see happening, like in my community, uh, everybody's on the 5G bandwagon, which is not a bad thing, but they don't want to talk about anything else. They mm. can't link it. Like I can't talk about chemtrails or and then we have a chemtrail group that that's all they want to talk about. They don't want to right. talk about anything else. And the problem is that's why this is working. That's why totally. I agree completely. Manifesting is you can't compartmentalize these. These are all, and, and that's why I would refer people to Alana's books is because she has taken information from all these different areas and pulled it together. And yeah, that's so in the in the in the third book too. Which that's is how really that's how they are controlling the information. Is they realize at a certain point that they're not going to be able to stop people from getting the hands on the information, right? But they get people specialized into one area, and they pick one or two gurus to be the champion of that thing. And they, you know, and there's no there's and there's very few people. There's no connection. Panoramic view. You really need the panoramic view. Like five G is not. A good thing but I actually think that like you it, this is more there's been more attention paid or allowed to be a paid to the 5g in the mainstream than any of these other topics because they know this is a really good rabbit hole to spin people down to get them to focus only on that and to ignore some of the other things that are going on okay. and to be quite honest 5g has been here for a long time it's not coming well it's it's, yeah. it's what it is. And again, about that it is devastating. it's it's going to be devastating and, and the reason is because it's doing on a genetic level something that it's, the others haven't done. That's what, what's so uh, fascinating about the 5G. But it's not, you're right, it's not just the 5G. It's how the 5G plays in. is working mm -hmm. with these other things that are already in place and how that combination, that synergy is going to change things in a right. big way. Yeah. No, I mean, that's how everything is. is it, everything yes. has, at, you know, it used to be three, but now it's much more than that. At least three rant components. Everything was tertiary, right? Right. Because humans like to look for one reason, one answer, one right. cause of something, and they're not looking at the interplay and that the if, individually, none of these things are, do anything really that serious. But when it all comes together, then that, that's when things it's change. Devastating. It's devastating. Yeah. It, it, it can be devastating. Um, and then also, like, they're already on to 6G, 8G, whatever. So they're letting everybody talk about the 5G now because it's done. It's been up and functioning for a really long time. We're living in the after effects of it. Just kind of like they, you know, people worry about the new world order coming, right? <laughs> like they didn't, they didn't let anybody know about the new world order until it was already here. And then you're just basically, and then on a certain level, like it goes the same with people who are afraid of like, you know, the apocalypse or the end of the world or Armageddon. It came a long time ago. We are living in the aftermath of it. We're just talking about it now. Yes. You know, like we don't, you know, so I think that's kind of, you know, that's another way that they sort of do that. And, you know, but um, the other thing I wanted to go back to when you were yeah. talking about the crossover and the way that mm, real life and, and remote kind of blend together is I think that transition you talked about being in the 70s and that makes sense for this. For me, it was. I don't know if that's well, on it. 
I think, I mean, I think everybody still who's been part of projects and programs experiences some level of, but that was when it went strictly like we can listen to some who are a little bit older talk about just absolute constant ongoing torch. Someone like, like a John Storm, maybe, right? Like if you listen to some of the stuff that he talks about, you know, or whatever, and I'm sure there's older than him that we're not aware of that are talking about it, right? The person whose methods, technologies, patents and involvements i say are responsible for that would be john Lilly. yeah because john Lilly, you have to look at all the things that that guy was involved in and i don't know what his intent was i don't know if he's an right. evil bastard or if it was just this is actually a brilliant guy and right. take his technology and, and put things together but he had the tv show flipper so we're dealing with a certain level of awareness of humans attachment and connection to the underwater and that possibly being maybe our, an original home or, or some, something for us, right? He's the person who created the anechoic chambers or what we now know as the float tanks, which can have extremely healing properties, but can also be used to create, you know, contained boxes where people can be tortured and, and even that tor with frequencies. And then you also have the lily waves, right? I say, the lily, lily waves, waves right? Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that I've taught, the lily waves, one of the things that I've talked about, obviously, is my idea about sugar as programmable matter. And all of us MKs had sugar addictions, right? Well, apparently, I haven't had a chance to go watch the huge, the big thing yet, but Danny Katz and the clip of John and Bonnie Mitchell, you remember them? Yeah. Uh, talking about how sugar can be programmed by lily waves. So here you have underwater, MKs experiencing underwater programming, dep deprivation tank experiences, living in homes that have electricity with lily waves coming through it and being addicted to sugar. So that's a way that something, all you have to do is, you know, like eating, you know, when you have certain moods come on, you eat sugar, you know what I mean? You have this electricity running through your house that activates Absolutely. something. And so there's, he obviously, whether he put all these things together or he was just a brilliant man whose technologies show that there's this connection. You know, I, I my, 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 my theory has been, that it is sugar that brought us to this fallen state. So maybe there was a time when we could exist underwater and breathe for a really, really, really long time. And coming onto land and consuming this sweet stuff has reduced our natural abilities. Well, it would be a beautiful thing if we understood that and were able to regain them on our own. But if they want to program and control those abilities, this guy, you know, becomes a per his his revelations. And I need to go back and read some of those books. I was looking at a list of his books one day, and they sound kind of fascinating. I'm gonna go back and read some of it. But you know, no, I think I really think what happened there and who wasn't the only one like Ed Teller and him and, and as a matter of fact, I think they were buddies. Um, and there was a third one. I forget who it was now. But I mean, I think during that time, it may have been um, what's his name? The drugs, the L LSD guy. Oh, Timothy Leary? I think or so. Albert Hoffman. Albert Hoffman, Hoffman, Hoffman or Timothy Leary? Them. And I think I think what happened was, you know, these guys were brilliant. And they had big egos mm -hmm. and, you know, they started doing what they were doing and they were offered money to keep doing what they were doing. And, you know, I don't, I think they were run, which is, you know, on the esoteric side, this is the issue is if you're run by your ego, look out because, you know, they're, the, the dark forces are coming for you, especially if you're brilliant. And I've personally known some people like that, that were absolute brilliant and the ego was way out of control and, that was the in. You could see that was the in with the dark forces. So I don't know, claim to know any of these guys. You know I have very direct um, programming history with Lily's work back when I was 12, 11, 12. Um, but it was his work. It wasn't him. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have any memory of ever meeting him or anything. So I think you're onto something in the, in the respect. I'm starting to believe anyway, that these guys just got caught up in the ego and they were, you know, handed money. And I do, do not believe that they didn't know that these things could be used um, for dark, you know, it just maybe wasn't their intent, but they allowed it, it to happen. Intent, and I think they just kind of, I don't know anything about that. I'm just doing the work. And I think that's a big part of it. And that was a, a time when that's how it was done. You know, all these minds came up and these egos came up and uh, intelligence and military and, you know, they mm -hmm. just swooped in and corporate swooped in and said, you know, we'll give you X amount of dollars if you, you know, we'll set you up. You just do what you're going to do. And they're doing their dream job. They're doing 
you know, they're brilliant. They, yeah. This is where they've always wanted to go. And, and I think that's what happened. But I think at some point, especially I remember seeing this photo of, I'm pretty sure it was John Lilly, Ed Teller, and Timothy Leary, the three of them sitting there, you know, having a beer or whatever. And it's like, oh, yeah, I mean, that pretty much says it all right there is, um, you know, they were, they were an era of, of discovery of science. And, um, but I, I don't believe for a second that at some point, as they started to grow up and mature, that they didn't know. But by that point, though, they have an ego and a lifestyle and a following of women yeah. who will do whatever they say and all that kind of stuff. They probably can't open their mouth. I mean, they, they get taken out. Most likely, they probably knew that, you know. Well, they, I think, did, did, yeah. you, did you ever watch, did you ever watch Fringe? That character, Walter, Walter Bishop. I, I saw it, but I didn't watch, like, watch if it. If you watch the whole show, that he, the, like this, I mean, you know, there's, they're, they're giving us the tells and telling the story all around us, not together in one place. But Walter Bishop is that guy, he, you know, is yeah. that guy who like was just so curious about what was on the other side and doing all this stuff with not necessarily the intent to hurt people. But at a certain point he became aware he was hurting people, but he saw it as part of this bigger thing and told himself some story about how, what he was doing to these kids was going to help them save okay. the people, uh, whatever. And ultimately, you know, people end up that either completely turns the evil dark side and they're a gross bastard like an Aquino or whatever, or they end up mentally ill like this Walter Bishop character and he ends up in a mental institution missing a piece of his brain, you know what I mean? Or they die. You know, when you look at somebody like, uh, and this is one that I go to, somebody like a Terrence McKenna, Right, who I don't think innately was a bad person. I oh, think he may was, have been the, that may have been the third person. Maybe it wasn't Tim. It's one of those guys. So yeah. Terrence McKenna, just you know, there's some certain people you can feel something about them intuitively. I think he was just generally doing what he was curious about, and I don't think he ever did an evil thing. But at a certain point, they latched onto him because he was an amazing storyteller, and he was right. just getting people to come and listen to his stories about the psychedelic realm. Right. right. And, it, you know, you can start inserting characters, start inserting ideas into what's going on in the psychedelic realm. But I think at a certain, you know, at a certain point, you know, he caught on and wasn't okay with it. And then he died very quickly of brain cancer, right? Within a year, you know, same with someone like Bill Hicks, who wasn't a scientist, who wasn't creating this stuff, but he noticed things about it and started commenting on it. And when he wouldn't play their game, he's gone with pac pancreatic cancer in a year, right? They always have the quick sudden death. Right? Yeah. So you have the people like you, they have, they go insane and people can discount them because they went insane. They die of some sudden onset illness or they completely join, join the dark side. Those are pretty yeah. much, or they live the life in poverty and you know, can't get a job or whatever, right? Even though they're brilliant and they created the technology that the entire US military is being run on, but they're destitute. <laughs> Living in downtown Los Angeles on Skid Row, talking to the three other you know, versions of themselves that exist and the realities that all come together down there, right? right? right. That's the only people intelligent enough for them to have a conversation with is them and the other reality, right? right. So um, I think that, yeah, yeah so that, that, that was my kind of little, you know, add on to that, but, um, yeah, the Lily stuff, I, when I was just, I looked his name up and there was all these titles of books and I have to go read those. Those all sound fascinating. I was obsessed with that Flipper show when I was little. Yeah, yeah. I loved that. Like there wasn't too many TV shows that I was obsessed with because I was a very busy kid. You know what I mean? But I just loved that, th that Flipper show. Yeah. <laughs> and to yeah. find out that a person who creates all these technologies involved in mind control also created the Flipper show, that show had to be used for programming us. Yes. You know? I, there's no way one person can be connected to such a weird variety of things. Lily then, Wayne uh, and the Coke Chambers and the Dolphin Show. Yep, and then the um, the story, the movie, The Day of the Dolphin about Lily's work. I don't think I've ever seen that. That's what I was actually programmed with. Um, huh. And the dolphins are named Alpha and Beta. Um, and, oh wow! <laughs> oh, yeah. You gotta you gotta see it. I mean, All it's, right. a movie. it's a George C. Yep. Scott stars as I guess what you'd say is John Lilly and um but I have a memory I, I think I wrote about I did I wrote about this in the book of on my 12th birthday I believe I was 12 um I have this flash memory of sitting in a theater with a bunch of girls um watching this movie and my mother's there and I only know one of the girls it was supposed mm. to be my birthday party, but I only know one of the girls. I don't even know who the other girls were. So I don't think I was in a, an actual, you know, regular theater. I think mm. I was somewhere else. And my mom was probably one of the chaperones, you know, she was mind controlled too. So the movie theaters are a huge part. 
but it was that day of the dolphin that was the movie um the that, movie theaters were okay party yeah the movie I, movie theaters and going to the movies i think going to the movies is code for going to you know as a yeah. code but yeah like i think about like well for me till this day like i i have a really hard time staying awake in movie theaters which i think is a huge tell for me Interesting. Um, i have a hard time staying awake watching movies in general sometimes i can usually sometimes make it through just an hour show but yeah. I, it's almost like i go into like a hypnotic state or something that is just really difficult to fight i try to fight yeah. it it's difficult yep um but the movie theater like i remember when, like having really strange things happen like losing things at certain movies but these are all movies that i would say play into my programming which would be movies like never ending story flash dance uh I can't remember if it was the Rocky movie or like the first blood or, you know, these kinds of, these kinds of movies that are very programmy. I would have things happen like wake up really quick, thought I'd seen the whole movie, but suddenly I feel like I just woke up. And then when I get home, realize like I left something at the movie theater, you know what I mean? Like, and then I was upset about having lost, le, le, like, like I remember one time I lost this purse that had like a unicorn on it or something, right? Oh, I was really upset about having lost the purse, which would then distract me from anything else that may have happened over the course of the movie, right? And then the thing, actually the thing that happened, and I haven't ever really talked about this on the show before, that really made me go, okay, this is enough. Something is going on. I have to pull myself down to a very basic level of existing so that I could understand what's happening here was I was in um, Boston and my mom was in the hospital. She'd had a stroke and I went out to the car to take a nap. And um, I was in one of those sleeps like I would go to in the movies where I just couldn't get myself out of it. Like I was trying to wake up and I just couldn't and I just couldn't. And um, I finally wake up when the phone is ringing over and over and first I missed it. And then I called my sister back and she was like, are you, are you coming back? Are you ever coming back? And I went back to the room and she showed me that like at some point I had sent her a text letting her know that I was at the movies. Oh, wow. Well. And I was in the car sleeping, or at least I thought that was, the, but I felt so tired and yep. so drugged. And I looked at the text and sure enough, it said, I'm at the movies now. It's something like, I'll call you back. I'm at the movies or something like that. Well, which is yeah. not something I, I almost yeah. never go to the movies. I don't think I, I because I, I know that I fall asleep when I go to the movies. Yeah. So the movie theater, going to the movies, being taken to the movies. Well, I've got a story too. Movie. This is my big one was when I lived in this area before and right over in the village, I'm a stone throw from the little village that I'm in. I worked in a gallery and I was living in the gallery too. I was actually sleeping in the gallery on the floor. Um, and it was a Sunday. I remember this. And this was during um, my first year of deprogramming. This was actually during just probably the first handful of months. And I had a thought. We closed at five on Sundays. And I had a thought, go to a movie. Yeah, I'm going to go to a movie t today. And so I I don't know if I went online or called the theater. I probably called. The, yeah, I called the theater and listened to the runoff, the recording. And there was a, um, a movie name I knew nothing about. Didn't know who was in it. Okay. And um, I go to the, so I, I pick it. It was the movie Body of Lies. It stars um, Russell Crowe and Leonardo DiCaprio. And it's a spy film set in the Middle East. And I didn't know any of that. Okay. All I said was body of lies. I'm just going to go and see what that's about. So I pack up after work, close the shop up and I drive into town and I go in the theater and I'm sitting there watching the movie. And I have to preface now I have to backtrack one week, one week, one week prior um, I was still very much programmed. I was flipping in and out. I was losing time, all this stuff. And I get a package at the, the gallery, which is not a delivery address, okay, uh, for me. I have a, a general delivery PO, you know, at the post office. I have general, I have no address, but a package shows up for me from somewhere back, like, I don't know if it was Michigan or something like that. This is one week prior to me deciding to go see this movie. This package shows up, and I remember thinking, well, that's interesting. How did they send it to me here? And I open it up, and it's an outfit. It's a top and pants with a very, it was black and white, 
Okay, those are the only colors in it, which is very Masonic. Mm -hmm. um, and the top had a very particular design. I mean distinct. I have never seen it before or since. Hmm. The black background with white on it, but very, very distinct. And I would eventually take the time to draw this into my journal. It was that distinct. So anyway, I was just baffled a week prior why I got this outfit. I didn't order it. I, when my boss came in, Allison, I asked her, did you? And she said, no, it's not mine. And I said, well, it was addressed to me, but you know, and in that time, that week's time, I told uh, the guy I was working with up in Salt Lake about it. And he told me he had had previous experience with MK Ultras who had been sent things mm -hmm. that were cursed. I know how that sounds old fashioned, but in other words, they put some bad mojo on it. They send it to you and then you ha have that mojo. And I, by the way, in the years since then, I bought something at a secondhand store that I had a very profound experience and I wound up getting rid of them. It was, mm -hmm. it, so this shit's real. It does work. Mm -hmm. um, if you're not paying attention, I got deathly ill from the thing I bought in the, um, it was a pair of shoes and I wound up having to get rid of them. Um, so in this week's time before going to the movie, I talked to this person and we talk about it and he says, don't just throw it out, either burn it or cut it up, get rid of it. So I am in the back of the gallery at night. I had to hide in the gallery. So it was kind of dark. I think I had a candle going and I kept losing time and I'm shredding this thing with a big pair of scissors. And then I bag it up and there's a dumpster out back and I put it out back. So this week later, this Sunday, I decided to go to this movie. <laughs> flip me out. So I'm sitting there in the theater all dark, scrunched down in my seat. It's a good movie. We're about, I don't know how far in, halfway through. And there's a scene with Leonardo DiCaprio and this uh, nurse that he is attracted to, this Middle Eastern nurse. And he, he go, they go to a cafe and they sit down to have tea. And what is she wearing on her head? Her scarf is the exact, down to the pinpoint material there's a noise going to start up. I apologize. I'm in a room where I thought this noise was taken care of, but it's starting up. Um, exact same scarf. She's got, it's the exact same material as the top. Wow. And as soon as I, I mean, I've never seen this before, never seen it since. This is some strange outfit sent to me out of God knows where to a place that isn't a, a mailing address. Um, and I remember the adrenaline shooting through my body and I heard in my head at that second, we know exactly where you are every minute of every day. Yeah. That to me is like a very perfect example of the interplay between reality and technology. And I'm, not, I'm, looking, I'm like looking around in the theater, expecting someone to be sitting there glaring at me. No one's there. Mm -hmm. this, is re this was remote. There's no doubt whatsoever. Yeah. That, but what a setup. Yeah. I mean, what a setup. Yeah. Over the course of a whole week mm -hmm. um, just to scare the living shit out of me. And it yeah. did. I was still in, in total paranoia phase. Leonardo DiCaprio was in a lot of those movies, right? Kinds of movies. Well, that. Leonardo, uh, well, so he's just, there's a new movie out that my dad went and saw and I'm gonna go see it called Once a Time Upon, uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. It's about Chatsworth. It's about Chatsworth and the Manson Tunnels and exactly where all my shit went down, right? And he's in that movie. He was in it. You, know you know that what they do is they present an angle and they don't present the whole truth. They're not gonna I'm gonna go yeah. see it too. It's playing here. I want to go see it too. For yeah. that he was but, also in Inception. He was in what yeah. was that one? The talented there so he was sorry he was in the Catch Me If You Can right wasn't he he was in all these kinds of movies he you know he's in all those types of movies and uh i think he's heavily used and didn't he did a lot of activist work and even his activist work made me suspicious you know yeah. I mean, that's when i actually became suspicious of him was his activist work and i forget what it was for now but it was it's like it's climate changey stuff usually yeah, climate change you know i mean yeah, yeah. he yeah. was like the first celebrity that like really pushed yeah. driving a prius instead of a fancy car right so yeah. That, yeah, yeah, that kind of is a giveaway. So anyway, yeah, movies. Oh boy, movies. <laughs> <laughs> movies. So we're 
getting soon close to sort of the end of the first hour. And I know, I know that there was an incident that you wanted to kind of talk about that. I think you wanted to talk about that in the first hour, right? How much time, how much time do we have? I, t I think, we, I think we started a, I think it's about 10, 15 minutes. Okay. Yeah. So, but if we go a little over, it's okay. I just wanted to sort of okay. get that in, in the public hour because I know you wanted that to. That sounds good. Um, so. so one of the things I wrote about in my book was in 2008. Um, it was late March, early April that I, was able to meet up with um, the guys that, you know, the floodgates opened. That was 2008. And everything just started flooding forward. They were in Salt Lake. I was in New Mexico. I drove up to them and came back. And I noticed when I came back, um, even on the drive back, um, I had a couple on a motorcycle. That was a very profound experience for me. Um, I was still very paranoid. I was still programmed. I'm still losing time, altars are pushing through, and I realized on the way back to, to the Taos area um, that this couple, because I had to do detours, <laughs> the roads were closed, and I discovered that this couple that had been on the side of the road the first time I saw them waiting for me, um, started following me. Um, and I tested it just to make sure. I took, you know, stops, turns, and it was on the money. Um, and so I finally, uh, finally dealt with that coming back here. They were uh, clearly there to make sure that I came back. I don't know if there was another alternate purpose at that time. Anyway, I came back to uh, where I am now. I've just moved back here last year uh, for really good reasons. <laughs> so I love it here. I love the land and I've got some good friends here. Um, and so after that, over the course of several months, a variety of things occurred. And one of the things, the most, uh, I would say the most pivotal, one of the most pivotal, if not the most pivotal moment in that deprogramming for me was um, I hike in the mountains here a lot. Um, and one day I drove up. And the way it's set up, when you're driving up the valley, there are trails at the top, up the base of the valley, but there's tr a few trails on the way up. Uh, there's four trails. One side of the road is the creek all the way up. It's beautiful. And then the other side is where the trailheads are. There's four of them. And I drove up, and you can, on some of these trails, you can park on the creek side of the road, just off the road, just right here. Um, and so I pulled off. And I was taking my time getting my stuff together and I looked up and I saw this Subaru wagon with blacked out windows, nothing fancy, drive slowly by and disappear around the curb. And of course, back then I was pretty, pretty observant because um, I was so scared of everything um, and had some, at that point had had some close, uh, actual physical close calls where I, you know, with surveillance and wondering if someone was going to try to hurt me. So I just, I checked it and didn't think anything of it. And I'm still getting my gear together. And literally less than a minute later, it comes back from around the curve and slowly drives by and goes down and disappears around the, the south end curve. And I, so I red flagged it, just kind of like, hmm, that's interesting. They're probably just trying to decide which trail to go on. Well, I still hadn't left when they came back a third time. And that time, I remember the hair on the back of my neck kind of raised up, and they slowly went by, but they again disappeared around the curb. So I was ready, locked up the car, and you go up, and um, these are some pretty steep trails, um, really nice. There's the creek all along the way, and I was in better shape than I am now, and I did a little bit of jogging and walking, and it, it really helped ground me. So anyway... I get up the trail and you cross the tree creek on this, several of the trails, you cross the tree creek several times. Um, and this is the first trail, by the way, and this will become important later when I talk about what happened to someone else up there. And I get to this place and it's, it's a creek crossing and I like to stand with my legs spread and let the water kind of run through, you know, through my feet. And it was a healing thing about releasing a lot of the violence and the torture and the trauma. And the sun, I remember the sun was shining wrong, right on me. I'm standing on these rocks. My eyes are closed. And bam, in my head, get out now. Just like that. Get out now. 
and my eyes popped open. I didn't even think about it. I just turned and started running down the trail. And this is single track. And those of you who know trail, it's only like this wide and there's brush on either side. These are not real smooth and paved, but I was, oh, can you hear that? What is that? Shoot. What is it though? It's a furnace and it was oh. supposed to be fixed yesterday. And I heard the rattling start. It's not going to stop. Um, it's, it's actually not that loud. I just wanted to make sure it wasn't just sure? whining. Yeah, it's, it, 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 yeah um, it got so, loud for one second, but I just wanted to make sure it wasn't an animal. I can, I, can, I can try and move, but I have to put the cats away, and they're in the other part of the house. So it's if, if, it's, if, it's, if it's still annoying, we'll switch you best spots when we take the break. But it's that okay. sounds good. For so right I'm now, okay. down the trail, full out. I don't know what's going on, but I, I can feel this adrenaline in me. And as I'm coming down, it kind of opens a little bit and I see a couple coming up. And they're probably 20, 25 feet apart on the single track. He's in the lead, she's behind him. Very fit, um, dead, dead to me, man. I, it's an, it takes one to know one. I know immediately these are not just regular people these are probably the people in the car that drove by three times. And I mean, it's instant. I don't know how to explain it, but instantly when I lock, lock onto them, I know these are operatives. These are probably um, special forces or Navy SEAL. Um, the way they're built, the way that there's nothing going on in the face. <coughs> and I'm relating it to my own kill alters is what's happening. And I immediately know the, they were sent I was supposed to have an accident on the trail today, but I've thwarted it because here I come flying down and we're, we're not at the beginning of the trail, but we're far enough down that I surprised them. And this is all afterthought. This isn't, this isn't stuff I thought about at the time, but what I realized after was they were probably told she's still programmed and she has skills. So it's not going to be an easy wham, bam situation it had to be farther up the trail it had to be a scenario where they could nobody else would be coming along they yeah, where they could surprise you off the rocks you know the rock face i mean this is some serious territory it would have been really easy and as i came up on them i went off the trail a little and as i went by him my hair stood up on the back of my neck he had sunglasses on she didn't and as i went by her same feeling um and then i mean man you've never seen me run but i kept looking back to make sure they hadn't turned around but i mean i was full out and it's lucky i didn't break an ankle or something on this trail um and i got to the bottom and as i came out to where i could see the road i looked across and here's my car parked facing uphill you know up the valley way and here's their car now there's space all along. They were so close. They were almost touching my bumper and being trained in certain altars. I knew this prevented me from a quick getaway. Yeah. I would have to back out and turn around, you know, to try to go down and get out of the valley. And again, the hair went up on the back of my neck when I saw the cars and I jumped in my car and I, I drove back to the place where I was living and working, which was not very far away. And it changed everything for me. This event was so pivotal in, in that they're coming for you. This is real. You're not crazy. All this shit you know, these people are coming for you. They're gunning for you now. You were not supposed to get off the trail today. And I mean, over the course of the next week, I ended relationships as best I could. One, I'm the, the people I'm living with now, um, I just tried to close her out. And then there was another young woman that I was confiding in and I just called her and said, just don't come around because I, I began to think they're going to go after somebody around me now, you know, um, and somebody could get hurt. So this was a huge event for me. I've never had any question whatsoever of who those people were, why they were there. And um, that I don't know who or what, if this was even technology in my head, but it might've just been a spiritual guidance that said, get out of here. Um, you know, it wasn't a voice. It wasn't a V2K like I heard the voice. It was that I understood, get out now. Yeah. So I'm not sure, you know, what the impetus was, if somebody was trying to save my ass 
or if the some, method of delivery is different when you're getting the message from your higher self or from a spirit yes. place than when it's coming from technology. And it's not like somebody talking to you yeah. or, um, you know, so anyway, so I hope I don't run you over too much, but no, you're fine. Keep going. I'll move back here. Um, last year I come back to my friends here and, um, and one of their friends, uh, my friends go away every summer. Uh, they have a place in Europe. And I take care of this place in the summer. And last year was my first year and we have chickens. And they said, okay, if you need any, pro any help with chickens, there's this guy in town. He's our friend. And I had met, met him. And he, they said, just go ask him anything. He'll help you out. So I started popping in just once in a while when I had a question. And every time I went in his store, he's talking conspiracy stuff with, you know, these people. So I finally, after like six times and I got him alone, I, I talked to him. He's a great guy. Um, and told him not the details, but just gave him the gist of, of my story. And we've kind of become distant friends. And so I went in, um, I went in a couple months ago to visit him and he said, Oh good. There's somebody I want you to meet. So it was another guy. I won't name him. Um, and he said, you have to talk to him because I told him about what happened to you on the trail here, you know, in, uh, 10 years ago. And he brought up that four years ago, and I, I sent you some links on this, four years ago on the same trail, the, the chef that worked for George W. Bush and the Clintons was, well, well they say died by accident, drowned in a creek. Okay, this creek, to drown in this creek. Is this, this is the creek you were standing at flushing out your, yes. yes. To drown in this creek. I mean, somebody has to be holding, somebody has to be holding your head under. I mean, there's areas where it's that, but to drown in it, somebody has to be holding your head under. There's no way he drowned in this creek by accident. So this was four years ago. And this guy starts telling me the story how during this time, there was a span of like, um, I think the guy's car was parked at the ch not down on the road but you can drive up this four kind of four wheel drive just a little area you can see it from the road just a little tiny area and i think his car was parked up there his girlfriend was in ski valley they he had just moved to new mexico and she was up in ski valley she reported him missing i guess that takes like a day then he's missing for like it, it, this is what this friend was telling me it was stupid because he tracked it he lives here he said he was missing for like four or five days before they even really went out looking for him. Um, and then it took search and rescue like 10 or 12 days to find this guy. Um, it's really, there are so many weird pieces to this. Um, and uh, I looked in the articles and it says that they found him 25 yards off the trail. That right off the bat 25 yards is an estimate that's not you know how you estimate you, yeah. you round off to five or zero yeah they estimated 25 yards i'm not buying it because there is a point on the trail where the creek you're getting away from the creek it's it's a farther distance but there's a significant part of the trail where the creek is within you know a stone's throw if not literally right next to the trail um, and so this guy tells me that during this time when the car is parked, he saw the car, didn't know anything about it at the time because the guy wasn't reported missing. He's hiking up this, this is his favorite trail. He and his girlfriend go up there all the time. He's hiking up one day and, and this guy doesn't really, I mean, he didn't really know anything about mind control or any, any of this stuff at this point. He's just picking up vibes. He's walking up the trail and he says he looks up and coming down the trail is a couple. And he says he stops because there's something not right. There's just not right about this couple. The guy's in the lead and he says, I'm talking, they are fit beyond human bounds. He said, they don't even look human. They're so fit. And he said, there's an energy because he said, like, I, he said to this day, I could, couldn't explain why I was doing this spontaneously. He said he started backing off the trail mm -hmm. and just slowly stepping back off the side so that when they went by, he was a good 10 or 12 feet away from them. I mean, he really needed to be away from these people. 
And they went by, and the guy first, and then the woman. And I don't think they're the same couple, by the way. I'm just, it's the same MO. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm absolutely convinced, absolutely convinced, due to my own experience and a little bit I know about this chef's death, that he was murdered up there. There's no question, because of what he saw for so many years. Well, being, and the Clintons are known for taking out well, all being, kinds of people. Being, so, at the White House during that time, this is a person that would understand that there wasn't really a difference between the Bushes and Clintons, that it's a, right. that, that the, and they probably would have witnessed the children being brought to the White House, the, you know, understand that those two, behind every Bush, there's a Clinton, and behind every Clinton, there's a Bush kind of, you know what I mean, thing? And who like, knows what they got a glimpse of one time. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And never had any intentions of talking about it. But what I do know is the Clintons of Clinton administration, I mean, they put out, they've taken out a lot of people around them. I mean, well, a lot of people have died around they them. Have, every time they're running for office, they have to go around and clean right? up, clean so, up. Some mess. Yeah. So he's, he, this happens and he feels a real affinity to this guy that died. Um, and there's another reason which I won't bring into it. It's very personal, but turns out they were born like on the same day and, and something he was doing on the trail before he knew the guy was lying in the creek and all this stuff. Um, but anyway, he just, he really feels, I can tell it just really impacted him and he really feels an affinity to it. And he's the one that said, he said, it's ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous how long it took them to find him. Mm -hmm. This makes me think. I mean, people, people who hike the trail go over to the creek all the time. I mean, and supposedly this guy's la been laying in the creek all this time. And it, what's, it was like, what's the name of this creek? What's the name of this hike? Oh, this the trail is Yerba. Y-E-R-B-A. Yerba. Yeah, it's like Yerba Mate, right? Uh, the, yeah. Yerba. And what is the name of like the creek or the area that it's in? Yeah, it, well, Towski Valley is... is this is making me think of some of the Dave Politis stuff. Do you know who Dave Politis is? I know the name, but he's I... He's the guy who has that missing 411 about people who go missing in national parks and in areas like this. Right. And, and he, he taught, you know, sometimes the people will be found a certain number of days later after that area has already been searched many times. Right. And somebody I mean, these are trained people, supposedly. Right. These right. This is what these people do. They go out looking for people. I knew people in Moab and man, they're Johnny on the spot. I mean, these yeah. people are amazing. What was they called out the National Guard. They had the police in there. They had the right. National Guard. what happens with all these things. Yes. Yeah. They had helicopters well, and the claim in the article. I get a kick out of this the rough terrain. Well, yeah, this is a magnificent. All of them are in canyons. But I used to run these things. I'm running over rocks and roots. I could run them back then. You yeah. know, I could run the trail. This is not so thick and insane that you wouldn't be right. able to find this guy. So yeah. maybe we're on to something as far as the amount of time. Well, also, there's some of the, he's got documented a ton of the many, many, many of these cases. But there are some of these where the water would seem, I think I heard him say, this doesn't make sense. That somebody would drown in this creek or uh, whatever. So there's been that. Um, Dave, and what was this guy? This guy's, this guy's not some, uh, my impression was, this guy's not some athlete. What was he doing 25 yards off the trail? If that's, you know, if he was doing way off the trail... I mean, yeah, you'll go off the trail, but it's it's a canyon. I mean, if you decide to go off the trail, you're going to be climbing. Yeah, well, you're be climbing. one of the things that, with Dave, so Dave is doesn't. And this is actually why we've never had him on the show. You know, I I highly respect his work. I think it's quite amazing, and I think this is when I went down the Dave Politis rabbit hole. Like, there's some shit that just interests some people, doesn't interest me. Other shit that I'm like, oh, this is fascinating. I went deep down the David Politis rabbit hole. And the reason we've never had him on the show is because he seems not to not really want to, and maybe he's doing this to keep his research clean, but he seems to not want to mm, pontificate about what he thinks may be going on with this. He just reports, okay. right? So he's written four or five books on this. Uh, I, I believe it, 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 so he said that maybe at some point he will comment on it, but he, at this point he's not. But somebody else uh, other than Dave took a map of the spots that Dave has documented these cases on. And mind you, Dave has done a lot of um, FOIA requests in regard to some of these missing cases and it bumped up against some very heavy resistance. Heavy, heavy. Like, we're, we'll give them to you, but it's going to cost you a million dollars and take seven years. Like that kind of stuff, right? Um, 
somebody else went and took the map of where he has found all of the, all these cases have been and superimposed it over a play, uh, over a map of where known underground bases are and it's uh -huh. almost a perfect match well see this doesn't surprise me at all yeah and, you know this takes me back to this takes me back to not necessarily regarding this chef but um because i really believe that he just he witnessed something he witnessed something that he wasn't supposed to witness and it may have only been one time in all those years that he worked for them and yeah. had no intentions of blabbing but you know when you look at the history of the clintons and the, a lot of the people that have died that have worked around them particularly the clintons uh, administration, um, you know, it just makes sense that um, they're they're just making sure they're just. I'm gonna, sure. I'm gonna go watch that movie Body of Lies and see if I can put because I'm good at putting together funny stuff. I'm gonna go see if there's something in there that they don't want you to understand about yourself, and that would be the reason to do this thing with the scarf and the outfit and whatever. Because well, I can say this with that. A lot of the movies, and that's why I'm drawn to a lot of the types of shows and movies I watch, is because. Um, the characters, particularly the ones working for the government or the Knox or, you know, whatever, or the corporations, um, I always relate. I can see inside of, of things like, you know, I don't know if you remember the, um, oh God, what was his name? I remember when it happened, I was living in Moab. Um, it was in Pakistan. Daniel Perno. Raymond... The guy that was supposedly had diplomatic status, and it was so, it was so bullshit. He was he was so spy. I mean, he was just a spy, and this whole story broke in the news. And I mean, it was just like I could see inside everything. And, and what I'm getting to is, I go to movies like that intentionally, even though this one I didn't go to intentionally. I didn't even know what it was about. But I go to them because I resonate with them so deep. Well, that was so early in your deprogramming that you yeah. were being pulled towards it without it being a conscious decision. Yeah. And as you become more deprogrammed and more aware, it, it either feels or is a con feels like it is or yeah. it is a conscious decision. So I'm going to have to go watch that movie and see if I can pick it. It's, pick actually, it's actually a good movie. It's enter entertaining, too. A lot of them are just entertaining. But yeah, it's so but, it that that uh yeah yeah and i think a big part of it for me is the piece of um how they're worn out they're really worn out you're 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 destroying yourself in those in those jobs and that's a big piece for me was um what it does to you body mind and soul mm -hmm. and so i'm drawn to those uh real realistic shows that show they don't show the glamour even though you know, Hollywood glamorizes. Glamorizes everything. But Dramatizes. if you're paying attention, it's, it's drudgery. It's, um, you know, it goes against your highest being. It's destructive to you on every, every level. Um, and, and that's, it, that's really interesting. I, I still, 11 years in, um, am heavily drawn to tap that part for me yeah of course but yeah. i don't know why but, but yeah, i think most of us are yeah there's some people that just totally avoid it but for me it's yeah. too fascinating like you i know, can't not, say I, I can't not. <laughs> somebody will say to me it's just so negative don't you and it's like it's so real to me it's so yeah um it it draws me in because it is so real to me it's it's an experience of mine and and but i get it when they say it's just you know it's so dark and negative stuff i mean it's all violent and it's it's like yeah well okay i understand i i appreciate that you don't want to go but uh you know for me i just there's some resonance there so i can't not that's a, i can't yeah, exactly. not <laughs> Exactly. All right, guys. So this is rounding out the first hour here. Please join us over at patreon.com forward slash off planet media for the rest of the show. We're going to get into some more personal aspect of programming on the other side. We will see you there. At least before we go, tell people where they can find you. Oh, right. <clears throat> um, well, I, I just happen to have these. Yeah. This book, book, uh, book one and book two. Yeah. Um, and um, I have a blog site. Our life, uh, let's see. <laughs> Hang on. Yeah, I've been there in a while, huh? <laughs> Our life beyond mkultra.wordpress.com. 
And if you're interested, you, there's a link to the books there, but there's a lot of free information there. Lots. I mean, I really packed it up over the years. And then the books are also just on Amazon if you want to go straight to Amazon. So thanks, Emily. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. All right, guys, we'll see you on the other side. Taking a break. This is our Planet Radio.